Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Before we begin, I'd like to read the Passover activation chart. Oh, I mean the PAC evacuation policy. Sorry. When the alarm is activated, the event facilitator will call the concierge desk at extension 5600 or zero to find out whether or not to evacuate. If evacuation is determined, the event facilitator will initiate the evacuation as follows. Please exit the room immediately using either of the two sets of double doors and immediately clear the hallway between the pool and the pack. First to evacuate should be any residents walking unassisted or with a cane. All residents who have a walker, wheelchair, or electric cart should evacuate last with assistance. Once the room is cleared, the facilitator of the meeting will shut both sets of double doors and report cleared status to concierge. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Manishtana Hailoha Zemi Kal Halelos. Why is this night different from all other nights? On Passover, we ask four questions. This is the first question, and it asks, why is this night different from all other nights? The answer is, on all other nights, we eat either bread or matzah, but on this night, only matzah. Then we say, on all other nights, we eat all kinds of herbs. But on this night, we especially eat bitter herbs. Then we answer, on all other nights, we do not dip herbs all at all, but on this night, we dip twice. And finally, on all other nights, we eat in an ordinary manner, but tonight we dine with what they call special ceremony, reclining. Passover requires a Jewish kitchen to be changed over to a Passover kitchen. Changing dishes, pots, pans, silverware, everything to be only used on Passover. The house I grew up in even had a Passover kitchen. It was downstairs and contains a separate oven, a separate refrigerator, separate sink. It was known as the Pesach kitchen. It was a lot of work getting ready for Pesach for my mother. Converting everything and cooking for two seders was a big job. Our seders were big productions. They were 38 to 45 people each night. My uncle used to call them Busby Berkeley Productions. We even had our own Elijah make an appearance at one Seder. A gentleman came to the front door at the same time as my cousin Judy. My mother welcomed her and her friend in and we began the dinner. After dinner, my mother asked Judy, where's your friend? Her reply was, and so, I came alone. My parents immediately got up and checked the jewelry and the silver. <laughs> All was good, but the gentleman had left. Oh. He actually had an Elijah. <laughs> so now, speaking about Passover and some history, I'd like to pre present Shalom Schwartz. start with a moment of show and tell. Uh, I see others have brought these as well. And you know what this is? A Seder plate. This is a special plate that we have sitting on the middle of the table during the Seder. And it has five little indentations, actually six indentations, uh, all the way around. Every Seder plate has the same thing, and they each are used for one of the symbols that are used during the uh, Passover ceremony, Passover meal, or as we call it, the Passover Seder. On this plate, there are whoop,
On this plate, there are five symbols. The zra, the shank bone, which reminds us of the Passover sacrifice. sacrifice that was eaten when the Jews came out of Egypt. The night before they left, big ceremony, whole family together had to finish everything that they made so they wouldn't carry anything with them. That's the zroah, that's one thing. Second main thing is the bitter herb, the maroah. I'm really sorry I forgot and threw out my big maroah. My daughter brought one that was about that big, about that big. Ours was about that big and we almost had a pistol fight with them. Uh, the maror is a, a horseradish, and that is to commemorate the bitterness of life in slavery. Those two are biblical. All the other symbols are non-biblical. They came later. There is the kapas. The, the green vegetable, and various traditions use various, that's various vegetables. We traditionally use parsley, but you can use celery, you can use any other green vegetable, and in many traditions they use romaine lettuce. Uh, <clears throat> any vegetable that is bitter. Now, romaine lettuce isn't very bitter anymore, but apparently uh, 2,000 years ago, it was quite bitter, and it was also used uh, commemorating the suffering. Uh, commemorating, what am I to speak? Commemorating spring, because Pesach, Passover, is a spring festival. Next comes the Haroset. The haroset, I can't translate for you uh, because there is no English equivalent. It represents the mortar that was used, as it were, to put the bricks up in the buildings that the slaves were building. Jewish slaves did not build the pyramids, by the way. Timing was off by hundreds and hundreds of years. But they did apparently build. The biblical story is very clear that they had to make bricks and build with them. And the the the, the, the equivalent of mortar is made in very different traditions. Our tradition, and probably that of most of you who make it, is apples, nuts, cinnamon, and red wine, sweet red wine, all ground up together to make this mortar-like substance. But in the Middle East, for example, they make it with dates, figs, ginger, and various spices. And those are the only two traditions I know of, but there are undoubtedly other traditions Every community just made it in a way that it looked like mortar to them, and then it was made with the substances that were readily available in their uh, geographical area. Uh, next is the chazeret, little pieces of bitter herb. You don't have to bite into the whole long horseradish, but rather you cut little bits of it off and the parts that you eat are taken from the plate uh, in the place where you uh, have the little pieces. And finally, the egg, a roasted egg. Now, why we want to have a roasted egg, there are two traditions. One is that it represented the sacrifice which was no longer done by the time the egg was introduced. Uh, because it was after the temple was gone, but the egg represented the 
Passover, special Passover sacrifice that used to be brought. The other tradition, and probably both are true, is that eggs symbolize the cycle of life. Eggs have within them the newly growing embryo, the beginnings of life, and they are round like the cycle of life. Wherever you are, it's going to go on and on and around over the centuries. There is one symbol that's missing. It's not on the Seder plate. What is missing? Yeah, I mean, the orange is a very new, late uh, addition. What's it for? Women. 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 Okay, I've never heard of it said for women, but I guess that could be one. Why would we? What have did you women? hear? What did you hear? Uh, that it's been added to commemorate Ukraine or ongoing current problems. Uh, oh, yeah, know. are you? I don't know, I never saw you that. Asked for what's missing. What's, uh, I, I, what's missing, yeah. Uh, yes, on Friday night, I observed on the Seder plate that we went to and enjoyed the Seder. There were two things that I think you didn't mention. Maybe there were olives. Yeah. And matzah. matzah. Ah, oh, nice. now olives is an addition that just those people made. But matzah was missing. There is no place. There is no place for matzah on a same way. They added, they added matzah, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Thank you, Hardy. He's the guardian of the piano. Uh, you should see him. He takes on and off the, the cover. Uh, the matzah is not placed on the Seder plate because it gets its own special treatment. You have three matzot, that's the plural, three matzahs that are put into, and I didn't bring it today, a uh, special cover. In some Seder plates, you have two story Seder plates. And on the top story, you have the matzah, which is the third biblical thing because the matzah was eaten in commemoration of the leaven, unleavened bread. The story goes that they were racing out of Egypt. They couldn't make bread that would rise, carried it on their backs, the dough, and the sun baked it, but they got flat cakes. Uh, we all eat our matzah dry, I suspect. Nina and I once went to a restaurant in Israel, and they served us wet, soggy matzah. What's this? Please bring us some matzah. This stuff is no good. They brought us more wet, soggy matzah. <laughs> the tradition among uh, Moroccan Jews and many others in the East is to soften the matzah in water. I don't know if there are any big matzah fans out here, but until I get some butter and honey on it, matzah is pretty dry and unattractive. And if you have the special matzah, the shmura matzah, it's cardboard. Right. I just threw two of them out in the compost today that we had no way that we were going to eat. Uh, so sometimes you have matzah, which is, uh, so you can have, you can make it wet. Don't worry about that if that happens. Now, the matzah, as I said, is the third biblical thing in the Haggadah. The rest is all post-biblical. There are shankbom, matzah. Those are the three. Why do we have a Haggadah all together? Because it says in the biblical text, in commemoration of Passover in the desert already, that he got the You should tell your child on that day all about what happened 
on the way out of Egypt. And that's the Haggadah. The Hebrew Behigadta is you should tell. And the duty is interpreted and turned into the Haggadah. Oh, now a quick quiz. How many times is the name of Moses, the hero, mentioned in the Haggadah? Zero, I see yeah. people telling me. That's right, zero. Why would they leave out the main character in the whole story? He doesn't exist in the Haggadah. Why? 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 The Haggadah was developed originally in the Mishnaic period, the period from around uh, 50 before the Common Era. Jews talk about before the Common Era and the Common Era. Rather, rather than BC and CE uh, and AD, we say BCE, before the Common Era, and CE, the Common Era, it refers to the same dates as the uh, Christian. BC and AD. It started about 50 years before, but its real development began in the 250 years of the Common Era, and then continued to develop through the Middle Ages on until this day, where you will find many different Haggadot with all kinds of traditions in them. But the one thing never put into the Haggadah is Moses, because the Haggadah developed in the period of the competition between Judaism and Christianity. And in Christianity, there is a central figure who is looked upon as the Son of God. And the rabbis wanted to make very, very clear, we do not have any character who is of critical importance. It's all God's doing. He may be working through a human being, but we don't want to feature that human being. Question number two, what language is there in the Haggadah other than Hebrew? Aramaic. Aramaic, good. Why? That's what they spoke at the time, thank you. There are two things, one at the very beginning and one at the very end. At the very beginning, there is a prayer called Halach Ma'anya. This is the bread of affliction with, when we first hold up the matzah. And at the very end, what's the last song you sing? Hagadya. Chagadya is in Aramaic. Chagadya is one goat or kid that, um, and that's Aramaic, not Hebrew. Okay, number three. What's the favorite number in the Haggadah? Okay. No. Here is 10, 10 plagues, but four, right? There are four questions. There are four wine, glass cups of wine. of wine, and four children who ask the question and get answers. So four is the critical thing, okay? How did the 10 plagues relate to the creation at the beginning in Exodus, in Je Genesis, Reshit. What's the relationship between the 10 plagues and the creation of the world? Any ideas? If you look carefully at the 10 plagues, what you have in the 10 plagues is the destruction, the opposition to each of the acts in the creation of the world. 
if you only a few examples. First thing that was created, light. Light versus darkness. Plague, darkness. Three days of the most dark darkness there ever had been. Couldn't move because it was so dark. Um, water. Water was one of the critical things when there was a separation and there was the water below and the water above that were created. What's the plague? Yeah. Blood. The water was turned into blood. Uh, how about one? Animals were created. What's the play? The diseases of the animals, Deva, that killed off all the animals. Or uh, just one, oh, we'll take one more. The growing green things, the crops that were created. What's the play? Locust, hail, all destroyed. Uh, the locust destroyed the ones that were already growing. The hail destroyed all the buds of anything that was left. And finally, human beings were created. What's the plague? The death of the firstborn, right? And you could go on and take each of the plagues. I won't plague you with more, uh, but... <laughs> Sorry. No, that's uh, good news <laughs> to um, But uh, that's okay. That's the plate. Uh, so let me then just say a couple more words about the Haggadah in Berlin. As I said, the Haggadah developed over the centuries. At the end of the Mishnaic period, about 250, you could have gotten through the Haggadah in half an hour. Okay. During the Talmudic period that followed the next uh, several hundred years, additional things were put in. And even after that, in the Middle Ages, additions were put in. And if you pick up a new modern Haggadah, take the J Street Haggadah, uh, you have all sorts of discussions of the oppressions of today, of slavery, of the Palestinians, uh, all added into the Haggadah. And the Haggadah can be recited in any language you want, because you're supposed to be telling it so it will be understood. It's not some prayer that goes up to God. It's a telling and a discussion among the people uh, who are there. Perhaps the most famous thing added was Elijah's cup, which was added in the Middle Ages, a cup of wine that sits on the table. And at one point in the middle of the, uh, actually in the middle, not later, in the later part of the uh, service, of the Seder, you open the door as if Elijah, who was supposedly the precursor of the Messiah who is going to come someday, comes in and drinks from the cup. He's never been known to come in, never known to drink from the cup, but you continue to do this in hopes that maybe he will come. But you had to open the door. And there was a section built in there in the Middle Ages when the Jews lived in various communities in Europe where they didn't dare open the door because if they did, they didn't know who was outside that might break in. As you know, there were blood libels at that time. The Jews used blood to make the matzah, for example. And so they were afraid. And a prayer came in there, which we tend to say with a little bit of discomfort which says, pour out thy wrath upon, upon, uh, 
are thy enemies. It said when they opened that door because they were afraid of pogroms uh, throughout. So that's just one of many, many, many uh, additions. Uh, nowadays, we would certainly talk about Ukraine or whatever else we are concerned with because the key message of the Haggadah is to protect and redeem the oppressed and give them freedom. The uh, critical sentence here is you know the feelings of the oppressed, of the stranger, because you were strangers in Egypt, and you must therefore always concern yourself with the welfare of the stranger as well. Central idea of the Haggadah. Thank you. all my life, uh, including two in Brooklyn the other days. Um, the strangest one was in uh, the Czech Republic when my friend Edna and I were traveling and we wanted to go to a Seder. Um, she's Israeli and British and American. I'm just American. And um, we couldn't figure out where to have a Seder while on vacation in the Czech Republic. So uh, she found out that some Hasidim were having open to everybody um, a Seder. With we, and we paid in advance, and we were there with people from all over the world in the lobby of the hotel. And, and the food was, couldn't be cooked there because the kitchen wasn't kosher, therefore they would during the entire service, they were just bringing in food from elsewhere, which was getting colder and colder and colder mm -hmm. over the hours. And then, um, once the Seder started, it was clear that the Haggadahs were in two languages, Hebrew and Czech. Um, I, I can read Hebrew, I don't understand Hebrew much, because my partner was 203 years ago. <laughs> And, um, and I don't speak a word of Czech. Edna speaks Hebrew, but not Czech, so she could manage. There was nobody else there except me who didn't speak either Hebrew or Czech. So they went around the table for everybody to say you know, their portion. And for the only time in my life, I was speechless. <laughs> <laughs> And I also was ignorant, <laughs> um, not just the choice. Um, and so they kept waiting for me. And eventually, Edna volunteered to do my portion. Um, it was the only savior I've ever been to in my life where I not only didn't feel like I quite fit in, but where the food wasn't delicious. <laughs> But I've managed to compensate since. And, and that's my story. Thanks, Wayne. Speaking about Passover in England is Raina Maisel.
all, it's the same Seder. Seder is a Seder is a Seder, right? Got that? Right. Okay. Seder is a Seder is a Seder, right? Um, but there are a few uh, differences. First of all, in England, there's an established religion. And that religion is not Judaism. That religion is the Church of England. So when you do anything there and you are not quite in the, in the scope of the, the big thing, um, it's a little, you feel a little uncomfortable. It's a little different. Uh, and there are very few Jews in England. Uh, in England, there are 60 million people. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right, in England, there are very few Jews. Uh, there are 60 million people in England, and last time I looked it up, it was 140,000 Jewish people. And they are not particularly welcomed. Um, when I was a kid, I grew up there, um, I can remember being chased across the local golf course with kids throwing stones at me. Uh, and uh, my mother did complain to the local authorities, and they did do something about it because technically we love the Jews in England, but it's not true. <laughs> uh, let's see. The, the service itself, of course, uh, is a service I have, uh, I have one from, from uh, uh, my childhood, my husband's childhood, actually, uh, and uh, we did all the, the whole. We did the whole business all the time, always, every year. Um, but as far as as England is concerned, uh, it it just goes on, but it's very much low. Uh, I mean, you would, couldn't go into Shoprite, for example, and buy matzah. Doesn't exist. The only place you could get matzah would be probably at the local kosher butcher if you could find one. Um, but there are kosher butchers there, and there were in the towns that we lived in. And most of the Jews live in London or in uh, Manchester, that area in the middle of the country. And not many, as I said, there are not many Jews there. So that's basically it for England. And then one questions about England and Jewish things there? Okay. Thank you, Rena. And now a verse from Frida Feldman. I wrote this poem in honor of the holiday. To me, the Seder was always fun when I was a child, mainly because we could do anything we wanted. Because the grown-ups were very busy being grown-ups, and we had nothing to do with their business, and they had nothing to do with our business. But this is a poem that I wrote about Passover. Tell me, Papa, what is Passover? Why not pass under or pass by? Please tell me, Papa, I wonder why. Why do we eat unleavened bread? It tastes so hard and dry. So many prayers that must be said. The bitter herbs do not taste good. Many different kinds of food. Then Papa sighed and took the book. It was large and very old. It was his grandfather's long ago. He opened it, the story told. The book reminds us who we are, and we give voice to who we were, our history. Let us rejoice. Okay, and now let's hear it for our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Ina. A beautiful poem, Freda, uh, and wonderful story of, of Passover, uh, Shalom, and 
I'm really looking forward to today. I, uh, okay. I have a couple of things, and one of them, you remember probably other times when I showed you my coloring book uh, from Hebrew school. Uh, this was uh, embossed and uh, bound by my grandfather, uh, uh, Isaac Rafalowski. Uh, he's a bookbinder down in New York, low in New York. And he bound uh, this book for me, my coloring book. The reason why I brought it today is that there are several pictures of the story of Passover. And I want to show you these uh, photographs. Uh, not photographs, but these coloring pages. Moses, baby Moses, and I'll read you. Oh, baby in the leaves, in the rushes. Yes, let me read you what what is on the back of it. I'm sorry, these pages are getting so old. In a little basket floating on the Nile, slept a little baby with a little smile. Ba Baby's name was Moses, oh so sweet and fair. Pharaoh's daughter, bathing, chanced to find him there. Next picture. The runaway. Hurry, hurry, Moses. Quickly, you must run. Someone has discovered what it is you've done. Please go far away to some distant land. There you will be safe from wicked Pharaoh's hand. <coughs> Another part of the story. Burning bush. The burning bush. The little bush. The little bush is burning from bottom unto top. It burns and burns and burns. It burns without a stop. Oh Moses, watch it burn, but do not make a sound. The place on which you are standing is very holy ground. Next picture is Moses speaking to someone, an Egyptian. The, the plagues, the 10 plagues. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, mighty king. King, let my people go. Because he was a wicked king, Pharaoh said no. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, foolish king, please don't answer no. God will punish you for this. So let his people go. I, this will be the last one, but this is the splitting of the Red Sea with the Israelites uh, passing through. Uh, so that's the pages that were in my Bible when I was going to Hebrew school and coloring at home. And then- How old were you, Mom, Connie, at that point? I'm sorry? How old were you when you were coloring? Probably uh, six, seven years old. Um, okay, I have a, I have a couple of other things. I have a, a other memory 
series of Passover, other memories. Uh, Pesach is traditionally a family holiday celebrated in the home. I grew up in the story of Queens. My mother's parents lived in the Bronx all through my childhood. I remember my family's trip to their home for Passover. Father would close his store early. He was a pharmacist. My father, mother, and older sister, and I would walk four blocks to the station to take the elevated BMT train to the Bronx. Riding the elevated train was always exciting for me. I would look out the window of the subway car at the streets below and be fascinated by the life on the streets. My eyes were wide open, seeing the tall buildings as the train approached the tunnel to Manhattan. There we changed trains to the IRT that took us to Jerome Avenue and Burnside Avenue in the Bronx over an hour's ride. We got off the train and walked to their apartment building. Reaching their door, we were greeted. I received big hugs and kisses from my grandparents. Fanny Birnbaum, my grandmother, was a wonderful cook. I was hungry, but the delicious meal had to wait. The story of Passover would first have to be told by my grandfather, Moshe. He worked for the New York subway system as a machinist, and he also had a wonderful voice. My three cousins and my mother's two sisters came by taxi from Manhattan. They were there for the Seder too. My grandparents' apartment was quite large, bright and cheerful, and was on the fifth floor of the building. What I remember very well was the dumb waiter <laughs> that opened up in Fanny's kitchen. This needs a little explanation. I found out that a dumb waiter is a small freight elevator or lift intended to carry food and packages from the first floor to the upper floors. I remember playing with my cousins sending objects up and down the elevator. I also remember hearing stories of how Grandma Fanny would prepare the delicious gefilte fish delicacy that I loved eating at the Seder meal. Grandma Fanny would first buy several large carp or white fish and keep the fish fresh in her bathtub. Yes, in her bathtub, so that the fish would stay fresh before poaching the mixture of ground deboned fish and carrots that she prepared. The small patty, now bought in jars, is often served with red horseradish. I remember my uncle Mark never thought that the horseradish was hot enough for his taste. Today I miss my grandmother's gefilte fish. In the beginning of the Seder, there is the tradition of asking the four questions. Why is this night different from all other nights? I was the youngest at the table. By tradition, I was asked to recite the four questions. I had gone to Sunday school and Hebrew school back in Astoria and knew how to read and sing the prayers. What I do remember very well was that I was still very nervous, but my grandfather helped me through the blessings with his strong and beautiful voice. At the end of the Seder, we all said our goodbyes and exchanged hugs and kisses. I still look forward to the long train ride back to Queens late that night. I now had a chance to look out the front window of the first car and seeing the lights of the city and the oncoming train trains as we made our way back to Astoria. Remembering seeing my family together celebrating the Passover of Seder has always been a wonderful memory for me. I'm not finished. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, Shalom spoke about one of the uh, important traditions and things that would be on this plate, uh, the Seder plate. Uh, 
before I have to find it. Well, you might you might be able to guess what I'm going to show you and guess what what I'm going to speak about. Anyone know what I'm what I made this morning? Yes, harosa. A Sephardic recipe of raisins, walnuts, and dates. And of course, here it is. And at the end of the afternoon, if you would like a little taste, uh, I would be happy that you do have some. Of course. Of course, I have some matzah. So, uh, you know, and wait, wait a minute. Couple plates. If you would like the recipe, I'll, I'll give it to you. I, I do want to find something. I hope so. We have time. Sure. Oh. oh, here it is. Here it is. Ha, ha, rose, ha, ose, ha rose. Uh, comes from the Hebrew word C H E R. Microphone. Sure. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay. Uh, harose, pronounced har ose, comes from the Hebrew word. Sheris, that means clay. Clay, C-H-E-R, clay, clay. Though it goes by many different names around the world. It is a sweet relish made with fruits, nuts, spices, as well as wine, and a binder such as honey. I didn't add any honey. By the way, I didn't bring the bottle of sweet wine that, that is added. Where is it? <laughs> oh, over there. <laughs> I, I thought someone took it already. <laughs> uh, okay. Traditionally, haroset is eaten on matzah during the Seder meal. Although haroset is a holiday food, it certainly shouldn't be limited to Passover Seders. It's a lot. Its sweet flavors and hearty texture make it a delicious year-round accompaniment to any number of foods, including chicken, turkey, lamb, and brisket. So tonight, if you see me in the dining room, if you would like a taste of it, add it to your table. You could, and if there's any left after this crowd <laughs> takes, takes it all, who knows? When eaten with horseradish, the haroset balances the bitterness and the moral horseradish, symbolizing the optimism of the Passover Seder. The cinnamon is haroset, is symbolic of the straw Hebrews had to gather in Egypt to build Pharaoh's palaces or constructions that they made when they made the bricks. Uh, and so, I, by the way, I've also added ginger powdered ginger and cinnamon to, where is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh yes, oh yeah, I forgot. Well, oh, I didn't bring an apple, yes. <laughs> Chopped apples goes into that uh, delicious, I, oh, I think it is, um, a mixture. By the way, how, how do you eat it? All right. Let me demonstrate. You put it on matzo. Yes, you put it on the matzo. This is what a piece of matzo looks like for those who haven't Don't tasted it. Okay. And so you break a little piece. Okay, you make 
and you take two pieces, and Sharon, did you help me? Where is my <laughs> How was it? Delicious. Wait. Delicious. Okay. Well, that's my spiel. That's my. Before we end, I thought it would be fun to sing two songs, sung to melodies, which are tunes we all know, under the accompaniment on the piano of Lola Weiss. Can, um, can I ask Artie a question? Can I ask you a question? Yes, Artie? Jean. Yes. Do you miss those old traditions, like you say, how you go to the subway? I know I miss them. Yeah. But I think, of course, I think, Do you miss them? I think it, all of us have gone through uh, our child. We remember our childhood better than I, what I did yesterday. You know, I, I forget my where my keys are, but I don't forget my childhood and my memories of, of being with my parents. I know you know. Uh, you know, it's a misnomer because. There weren't just four questions, there were five questions. What was the fifth question? When do we eat? <laughs> oh, I, I, I have, while well, songs are being handed out, I do have a joke. If you want to hear a joke, you may know. Uh, Deli. I want to tell stories. I want to tell sort of a joke. I, I thought it was going to be said before. Yes. Yes. All right, and before they we say, come on up, Kelly. Come on up. Oh, you have a thing I had to do. together, all of us, the entire family at times. Anyhow, I called my niece and said, you know, is this a Pesach? And she says, hey, Delia, I gotta tell you something. She says, there weren't just four kashas, four questions. There used to be a fifth question. What's the fifth question? The question is, why did it take 40 years to be in the desert? And it was a 400, maybe. 40 years, 40, 40 years. And the answer is because after 39 years, Mrs. Moses got away and asked somebody for directions. <laughs> Thank you, Dolly. Thank you, Dolly. Okay. Um, the first song is I've Been Cooking for This Seder to the tune of I've Been Working on the Railroad.
transposed by a, a rabbi uh, locally that uh, that I know. Our Passover things sung to the tune of my favorite things from Sound of Music. I give you our own pop, own pop.